Now, my father once said, if you aren't out to change the world when you're 20, you're never going to amount to anything. How many of you are out here to change the world? Nobody? Yeah. I am. I have never grown up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think all of us here are. We have that kind of idealism. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. But when we set out to, set out to change the world, we necessarily, almost naturally, un, almost unavoidably, move into an us versus them. Why? Because we have a vision of what we want the world to look like. And it's different from how things are now. And so we want it to look like this, and here's going on. And so we almost think, OK, I've got to get rid of whatever is making the world like this so that this can happen. There's a little bit of a problem in this perspective. We have a vision. We're here in world A. We want to get to world B. But we're ignoring how world A actually is. And the only way we're going to get from world A to world B is through a process of evolution. So one of the ideas that I want to present here is evolution, not revolution. Now, this is much more difficult. You have much less control. It takes a lot more work and a lot more effort. People get impatient, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all very understandable. But everything uh, proceeds through a process of evolution. It can be faster or slower. But it really is through evolution. <laughs> And there are three things you're going to need here. A vision, a philosophy, and a community. Now, if you think about this, this is exactly the three jewels. Buddha is a vision. The philosophy is the Dharma. And the community is the Sangha. So I'm going to talk about each of these. The first one, very briefly. Uh, Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. And this is true, as true of Lenin and communism in Russia, as it is true of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And I want to talk about that latter example for a moment, because they proceeded through nonviolent means. Starting with the tragedy of a mother losing her 13-year-old daughter to a drunk driver, 1979 or 1980. And she started this movement because up to that point, drunk driving was regarded as a slap on the wrist. That was the punishment for it. Not only did they get the laws changed, they changed society's attitudes to drunk driving, and they did this in one generation. And when you think about it, that is astonishing, to change the society, the attitudes of a whole society to drunk driving in one generation. So a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. What does the philosophy of no enemy actually look like in practice? I'm going to appeal to some important Buddhist themes, the principal one being the middle way. The first example is that the middle way says don't fall into an extreme. Extremes are dead ends. Therefore, everything has crystallized and is just solid. It, uh, it creates its own opposition. Nothing can move. And I want to give you an example of a person who has gone through some rigors of life, and here is how he views things now. I have come to see that we have an instinct for right and wrong and push it aside when it's inconvenient. That the more deeply we're motivated by emotion, the more insistently we pass it off as reason. That denial is a force to be reckoned with and our principal obstacle. That ethical codes are as likely to produce hypocrisy as goodness. That belief is precarious, especially when it demands certainty. 
that no religious, scientific, or academic faithful can be trusted that can't laugh at itself. That the only way to respect truth is to take it with a pinch of salt. And that life leads nowhere until we consciously take the direction it provides. This is by a person that I've only met only recently, Stephen Chatini, lives in Montreal. Uh, and uh, this is a, ch a paragraph at the end of his book with describing his experience as a, a becoming a Buddhist monk and then not becoming a Buddhist monk. <laughs> the second application of the middle way is embrace the differences. Another way of summarizing this is the tyranny of the or. Avoid that. Either this or that. That's what creates opposition. Black or white is what we say. But what happens when you take both black and white and embrace them? You get the whole spectrum of a rainbow. So by take, embracing both extremes, embracing the differences, you create a spectrum of possibilities. And there are far more ways to resolve difficulties and issues in your life when you have a color spectrum to choose from rather than just black or white. This is particularly important in conflict situations because conflict can only arise in a relationship. It expresses a problem in the relationship and the resolution of any conflict has to acknowledge the relationship that exists. And to acknowledge that relationship, you have to acknowledge that the, there is legitimacy to the other person's position. Diane was touching on this point in her presentation. But let me take you, ask you a question here. Opposition to gay marriage, opposition to abortion, <coughs> opposition to immigration, what do these three issues have in common? Now, I've asked this question before, and I usually get Republicans, <laughs> <laughs> which is true, largely. And if I push a little bit, I get fear, and I say, yeah, that's true. But what these three issues have in common is they have to do with the viability of a society to reproduce itself. And there are a lot of people in this country who feel that this, the culture that they know is dying out. And they're, they're right. Because if you look at the reproduction rates of Western society, the US is the highest. You need 2.1 children per couple to hold a society constant in a population. The reproduction rate in, uh, in America is 1.68. In Japan, it's 1.16. These cultures are dying out. And so there is a very legitimate concern. And when you address that concern, then you can have a real conversation and not just be in opposition. So one way of stepping out of their, this opposition and this enemy thing is to really understand what are the vital concerns here. And the third and last point that I want to touch on is obstacles in your path should not be regarded as obstacles. They are simply features of the landscape which have to be negotiated. <laughs> now, in my consulting work, what I, you know, when I'm not a Buddhist teacher, I'm Moonlight as a management consultant. And there's a group that I developed at a, uh, one corporation I was working with, and they were always telling me, we can't do it because of X, we can't do it because of Y. And I would just listen to them and say, no, you haven't told me why you can't do it. You just told me this is something that needs to be negotiated. You've got to work with it and figure out a way. You only t it only becomes an obstacle if you let it uh, negate your own intention and will. And Dogen has a wonderful thing to say about this. When you're talking with someone, do not try to convince them of your point of view Rather, listen to them, listen to them very deeply, and help them to discover the errors in their thinking. And when you do that, you don't have to persuade them at all. They persuade themselves. And there are tools that I can give you 
which really help you to actually open up that dialogue so they begin to question themselves. They're not manipulative, they're just a way of being present with the other person. So, let me conclude here. The vision I would like to see is a world in which, to the extent possible, the institutions and systems that we need in such a complex society serve the needs of the individuals rather than vice versa, which is where I feel we are today to a large extent. The philosophy that I would espouse, there is no enemy, and the community, well, here we are, a group of thoughtful, dedicated, committed uh, citizens. Finally, how does this work? I only ever cared about the man. I never gave a fig for the ideologies unless they were mad or evil. I never saw institutions as being worthy of their parts or policies as much other than excuses for not feeling. I believe that almost any political system operated with humanity can work. And the most benign of systems without humanity is vile. The trick, I suppose, is to find the system that gives the least leeway to the rogues. The guarantee of our virtue is our compassion. And if you allow this institution or any other to steal your compassion away, wait and see what you become. The man is everything. And if your calling is anything, you will always prefer him to the collective. Because the collective is humanity's lowest. And the collective is most often spoken for by people who are nothing without it. <laughs>